Good morning, everybody. It's great to see you. Welcome to Providence Church. I uh, want to welcome those who are here for the first time, or maybe you're coming back for the second time. We haven't had a chance to meet you. We're so glad that each of you are here. And I want to welcome in those who are joining us online right now uh, for this uh, moment and this time of worship. My name is Jacob Armstrong, and I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm really, uh, really, really happy to share with you today. I wanted to let you know about a couple of things coming up in two weeks. The first is on the night of Sunday, November the 3rd, we are hosting a community-wide service called One Hope. So there's an organization in Wilson County called Everyone's Wilson uh, that one of the things they do is help bring the churches together around unity. And uh, every once in a while, they have these One Hope services. And they asked us if we would host, and we said yes. And so I just wanted you to know about it. It is strategically a couple of days before the election. And the idea is that we would come together as the churches in Wilson County. Uh, that won't be the theme, but we'll be praying. I didn't want that to seem like uh, just like coincidence. Uh, it is, uh, we want to be intentional about the people of God to be in prayer. Uh, so I know of at least uh, 10 churches that are already going to be attending. And I don't do this too often, but I am, at, I want, I want some of you to be here. You know what I'm saying? We're the host church, and I want some of you to be here. So put that on your calendar, if you will, um, so that we can lead the community and be a part of the community in prayer. That morning at Providence Church will be our baptism Sunday. And so I just wanted you to see that. We'll be reminding you of that in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we have folks that are signed up for every service so far. Uh, and this morning and next Sunday, uh, Pastor Mark and I will be, during the last song, during communion and after the service, we will be down front. And we have clipboards. Uh, if you would like to sign up for the baptism Sunday, you can just come talk to one of us. We'll get your name and follow up with you. That's a day to say yes to Jesus. And some of you know that, that this is your time and this is your moment. Uh, so there will not be any pressurized situation for that, but I just want to invite you, if you know that's you, to say, to come forward uh, at the end of the service and sign up for that to be baptized or to recommit your life to Jesus. We'll, we'll baptize that day by immersion and also by sprinkling. It'll be an amazing, amazing time. And I'd like to just say, uh, we'll do this next week too, just say a prayer for uh, those whose uh, God is calling to their hearts, okay? God, we thank you for uh, all the baptisms that we've seen at Providence Church, each one of them a precious life to you, someone saying yes to Jesus. And we long for and look forward to these days like November the 3rd when many people will come. And so I just wanna pray for the hearts of people in the room, people online, uh, our neighbors, our friends. Uh, you do that work, God. Uh, Holy Spirit calling to hearts. And so we just offer our lives up to you and pray for a beautiful, uh, beautiful Sunday of, of seeing your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture is from Luke chapter 12. It begins uh, with Jesus saying to his disciples, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you'll eat, nor about your body, what you'll put on, for life is more than food and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his or her span of life? If then you are not able to do as small a thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass, which is alive in the field today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? And do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. For all the nations of the world seek after these things and your father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom and these things will be added to you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I wanna give you just a couple more verses uh, because these next verses that come just a little bit later in Luke chapter 12 form kind of the theme that we will be looking at over the next six weeks. So I just wanna read you three more verses a little bit later in Luke. It says, he also said to the crowds, 
When you see a cloud rising in the west, you say at once a shower is coming, and so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say there will be scorching heat, and it happens. You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? Interpreting the times. Have you ever thought about that? Jesus said to the people of his day, he's like, you guys can pinpoint, you might be able to say this to us too, you can pinpoint when a storm is gonna happen and where it's gonna happen, but you can't figure out how the way you're acting and talking is going to affect things. You can see the trajectory days in advance of wind and rain. You look at the sky, but you can't see the trajectory of your cultural and political discourse. You can interpret the skies, which if we think about it, it's really amazing that we can do that. We don't always get it exactly right, right? But the way that we're able to track storms today and even in those times with accuracy, Jesus is saying, anybody got any predictions on how the way we're living is going to end things up? I think he could ask the same question today. Why do you not know how to interpret the times? Or as he says here, the present age. I don't really see us interpreting the times. I see us reacting to the times. I see us fearing the times. I see us feeling anxious about the times. I see us wishing for a different time. Anybody? I hear people like Ronald Reagan. You know, I get it. You know, <laughs> but I definitely hear us talking about the times. But are we interpreting the times? Are we taking the mindset that God has given us, that Jesus has given us through 50 weeks of Luke, what we know about Jesus, what we know from Jesus? Is that our perspective on the times? Are we thinking about the times with a biblical perspective, with a Christ-like mindset? Because Jesus is showing us, this is what's so wonderful, Jesus is showing us how he looks at things. It's why we are studying the Bible. It's why we do this week after week, to understand who Jesus is, but not just understand who he is, understand the way in which Jesus lives and the way in which Jesus works. Jesus actually shows us his mindset, his perspective on life, on the world, on morals, on relationships, on money, everything. And so over the next several weeks, which will coincide with the couple of weeks before the election, my hope is we will be interpreting the times with a Christ-like mindset as shown to us in the book of Luke. Thank goodness we have 50 weeks of Luke under our belt. We're Luke experts. We're gonna crush the next couple of weeks. I wanna tell you what the mindsets of Christ are that show up in the next six passages of the scripture, what we'll look at the next six weeks. I don't usually do this, but I want you to see uh, kind of where we're headed. There may be one that you want to connect with especially. There's the anxiety-free mindset, the always-ready mindset we'll look at next week. The new life is possible mindset. Just imagine, it's gonna be baptism Sunday and Jesus is gonna give us a mindset that new life is possible at any time. There's the never too late mindset. Did you know Jesus has that mindset? It's never too late. There is the hard way is worth it mindset. Your preachers have been telling you the last several weeks, this is a hard passage, this is a hard passage, this is a hard passage. Well, guess what? The hard way is worth it. And then uh, lastly, we'll have this mindset, the throw-in parties mindset. If we're going to interpret the times correctly, we have to look at things the way Jesus looks at things. And we're gonna start uh, this week with the one that is a runaway, number one, hardest for me. I've told you before that when I was 20 years old, I was in college, I was living in a house with four other guys. I woke up in the middle of the night one night, it was in the summertime, my heart was beating out of my chest. I could not get my heart beat to slow down. I'd never experienced anything like it that I remembered. And the more I thought about it, the worse it seemed. I determined with all my medical knowledge that I was having a heart attack as a 20 year old in peak physical condition. I did not wake up any of the four other men in that house who were also my friends. Instead, I drove myself to the emergency room, alone, scared out of my brains. I walked into the automatic opening doors and to the left there was a payphone, and I thought that it would be smart to call my parents and that was smart. 
And so I called my parents on the payphone. I let it ring a couple of times. I actually remember listening to it ring, and I was thinking, what in the world am I doing? And before my parents picked up, I hung up. And instead of walking into the emergency room, I walked out. And I spent that night, all night, driving around in my car alone in a panic. And when I returned home the next morning, my roommates were all looking for me, as were my parents, who had received a phone call in the middle of the night with a caller ID from their college son's hospital. That day, it was a Monday, my mom took me to the doctor. And it turned out my physical heart was just fine. And it was the first time that I'd ever heard the phrase, it's really common now, but not so much 25 years ago. It was the first time that I'd ever heard the words anxiety attack. And I thought, not me. I got the world by the tail, you know? I'm crushing it. I'm having the time of my life. I was about to ask this girl named Rachel Shepard to marry me. I was pumped about it all. But you know, with all those good things going on in my life, my body was saying, it's too much. And I knew already that worry came really, really naturally to me. But that shook my foundations of thinking that I was a guy who had it all under control and could handle everything. And so, I started something in the year 2000 that I still do today. I'll I'll tell you, I did it Wednesday night. I was like, sure, of course, God, I'm doing this Wednesday night. And that is if I wake up in the middle of the night anxious. I will say scripture into the darkness. Verses became my companion when I was 20 years old. Verses like this, trust in the Lord, Jacob, with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your steps. Verses that were so crazy to me, they were the opposite of how I felt. Verses like this, do not be anxious about anything, but with everything, with prayer and petition, with thanksgiving. I'm laying on my back, speaking to the ceiling, right? With thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. I had to just start saying them over and over and over. And I said verses like Luke chapter 12, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink or about your body. Consider the ravens, consider the lilies of the field. Look at how God takes care of them. How much more value are you than they? I would say these verses because they're hard for me. I had to get them in my brain before I could get them in my heart and get my body to respond. I would say them before I felt them. I would believe them until I could see it with deep anxiety in my bones, the kind of guy that would drive to the emergency room alone, I would say to myself, do not worry. This is how a mindset is formed, by impressing things on your brain over and over again. A good coach will have different axioms, you know, things that they will say, A great coach will say things over and over and over again until the lineman puts his knuckles into the grass at the critical moment in the game and he doesn't just hear the words of the coach. It's as if they're running through his veins, right? A mindset is formed by what you let in your mind over and over. So think about right now what you put in your mind over and over and over. It is forming your mindset. Luckily for these disciples, they had Jesus in their ear. Jesus saying to them, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you'll eat, nor about your body, or what you will put on. We have so many different voices in our ears, and they did too, of course. So many things that can speak into us and over us. And all of those things are forming us. All of those things are forming your mind and forming your heart and affecting your body. And the first thing that they form in us, I really believe this, the first thing that the voices we listen to form in us is our understanding of our own value. 
All the different voices in your life have formed the way you think about your value. If your mom and dad always told you you were beautiful growing up, there's a good chance you thought that perhaps you were beautiful. (laughs) If they told you that, it affected how you saw yourself and how you saw your value. If your mom or dad always told you you weren't quite enough or the way they lived made you feel that way, it formed the way that you see your value. You see, the anxiety-free mindset, the first thing is, is you have to know how valuable you are. Without an understanding of your identity and your value in God, the anxiety runs rampant. So Jesus says, and I struggled with these, I still, you know, he says, don't worry about all the stuff. You're like, oh, that sounds easier said than done. But listen to how he sets it up. He sets it up by comparing us to something else. He compares us to ravens and lilies. Why? Because ravens and lilies are beautiful and they're taken care of and they live an anxiety-free existence. The raven doesn't have a job. The raven doesn't have a bank account. The raven has no storeroom, yet, Jesus says, God takes care of the raven. The lily doesn't have a job. It neither labors nor spends. It makes no income. It doesn't go shopping, yet it is dressed and adorned beautifully. Jesus says, God clothes the lily. And then Jesus asks, how much more valuable are you than the raven? And we have to think about it. How much more valuable are you than the flower? I wanna let you know that Jesus is not anti-bird or anti-flower, okay? The opposite. He's saying they're of great value, but the evidence is clear. You are of more value. I'll take on all the bird and flower activists this week, okay? On your behalf. Because you are more valuable than the birds, and you are of more value than the flowers. You're more valuable than something God takes care of its every need because you are a child of God, every one of you. You are a child of God and a person made in the image of God who is of great worth. Some of us, because of what we've heard over and over, have a different mindset. We have the mindset that we're not worth it, that we're unworthy of love or unworthy of attention or unworthy of safety or unworthy of forgiveness. The words of Jesus, why it's so important for us to hear them over and over and over is so that we would understand our great value. You know, one of the lies that's used in our current political discourse is that different people are of different values. Pay attention to it, that's all I wanna say to you today. Pay attention if you hear people, valued people, pitted against valued people. You see, the people of God understand that everyone is of great value, and so people shouldn't be pitted to against each other in a political game for political gain. We see things differently. We understand that when all life is valued, that you can actually find life-giving, loving, creative, godly, faithful solutions to all these problems that we're facing. Last week, there was a guy in the scripture who was trying to get Jesus to help him with his fight with his brother. He's like, I'm not into that. Jesus rarely would get into a situation where people were pitted against other people Uh, Another more famous time is they brought an adulterous woman who'd been caught actually in the act of adultery before Jesus. She was the object uh, of this shame, but she wasn't really the object of the argument. The argument was the religious people were trying to get Jesus in trouble. They said, she should be stoned. And Jesus says, I'm not picking up a stone, are you? He valued the person over the possible gain for himself or the political gain in that moment. The end result for Jesus, just so you know where this is headed, the end result for Jesus in this kind of action, the cross, true end result for Jesus, 
every kingdom is lower than his kingdom because instead of Jesus seeing himself as being a one-time Roman leader, Jesus of Nazareth chose the ultimate reign of God. And while establishing God's reign, Jesus was still able to be looking out for all the valued people of God. Practically for us, what does that mean? The starting place for us in just living our lives must be understanding our inherent worth to God, every person. I'm not, I don't hold, hold a great authority, I get that. Um, what little authority I have, I guess, is being the founding pastor here. And so I say over and over again, every person is a child of God and a person of worth. That becomes our perspective and our mindset and it impacts what we do. Kids in Peru matter. Water in Nicaragua matters. People without homes in Wilson County matter. Women in prison in Nashville matter. Grieving widows and widowers in our community matter. Are you following me? And what that leads to, when you start caring about God's people, it actually leads to peace, less anxiety, when everyone is valued and we're not just worrying about our own. The, the anxiety-free mindset, there's only two points today. And I thought like, let's, let's just let go of the anxiety, right? There's only two, two points. The anxiety-free mindset seeks first the kingdom. So much of our anxiety is just worrying that all the things will be taken care of. If I had to guess kind of what you're anxious about, it probably has something to do with just things being taken care of. And that's what Jesus is addressing with the raven and lily talk. He's saying, because they are valued, their food and their clothes and their shelter needs will be met by God. And as a valued people, what we do is we seek God first, and then he says, I know this sounds simple, but, but listen, and then he says, all the other things will be taken care of. So if you wanna know what to be seeking after, be seeking after this. It sounds simple, it, it sounds maybe too simple, perhaps. But clearly, the pathway to worry is thinking that we have to take care of all the things and the path to peace is finding a way to trust that God values us and is going to take care of us. The behind the scenes look into my 20 year old panic attack, and I had a bunch more after that by the way, was I was paying my bills for the first time, renting a house, and like I said, I just bought a diamond ring at Zales from Hickory Hollow Mall. <laughs> and I was trying to work up the courage to ask Rachel Shepard's dad for his daughter's hand in marriage. There was a lot on my mind. A lot that I thought I was gonna have to take care of, uh, a lot that I assumed I could just handle, when in truth, the truth was, it was all too much for me. And even though outwardly I was showing that I could handle it, my actual body was tapping out, saying, hey, let's, let's go to the emergency room, buddy. <laughs> Maybe they can help. What Jesus is showing us is the importance of our focus, our allegiance. Uh, we all have to work to take care of bills and people. None of that's off the table. It's not, it's not as if we just say, I love God the most and everything else is you know, taken care of. That's not really what Jesus is saying. He's talking about the way for our hearts to be at peace as we go about our lives. And so sometimes the way that he actually does that is by taking our attention off of the things that are causing us anxiety to see something else that will remind us of who he is. It's sort of why we're here today. We come in here and we're reminded as we see things and sing things and hear things of who Jesus is. I went to Chattanooga yesterday. My oldest daughter is in college there. She's 20 years old. And it just turned out that my whole crew was able to go, which is kind of like a miracle. And so I drive down there with my two other daughters and Rachel. We had this great day with Mary at family weekend at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. And we're driving home last night and I had a memory leaving Chattanooga that happened, I guess, 19 years ago when Mary was a baby. You do these kind of things when your kids start growing up, right? And I remembered we took Mary to Chattanooga when she was a toddler, and we'd had this great day. And yet, we also knew that Mary had missed her naps and that things were about to go haywire. <laughs> and so parents know we're driving out of Chattanooga and our only focus, our only hope, is for that baby to fall asleep. We actually had hand signals, Rachel and I in the front seat, you know, who I would be watching Mary in the rear view mirror and I would, these were at Mary's eyes and I'd be like, mm -hmm, you know. 
you know, we're not saying anything. We're not moving. And then finally, and that day when we were driving out, no sooner had Mary fallen asleep that I had to stop very quickly on the interstate. There was a wreck up ahead. And it was one of those ones where everything shut down. We sat there and sat there until finally I had to even turn the car off, roll the windows down on a hot summer night. We're both looking at Mary. And then an ambulance comes by, you know, roaring, blaring at sirens. And Mary wakes up. And it was a complete meltdown. And that was just me. <laughs> Mary goes berserk, right? She's a baby. She doesn't understand her surroundings. She doesn't understand what her body's telling her. She can't attend to every little thing she's feeling and thinking, and so she just cries. She just feels and expresses all the anxiety that a human can and blares it out into the car. And I'm still amazed how young moms, I don't understand how a mom who's only been a mom for a very short period of time can still be like a ninja mom, you know, and understand all the intricacies of being a mom. I don't understand that. But Rachel knew exactly what to do. And she reached back into the back seat and she unhooked Mary from her seat and she pulled her up onto her lap and she started speaking right into her ear. And this is what she said. She said, Mary, Mary, she said, listen, listen. She said, do you hear the bugs? And I thought, oh, this lady's losing it. <laughs> but I also put my ear to the window and I listened. We began to take our attention off how we were feeling, right? And we began to listen to this. I hadn't even heard it. But it was this almost like loud, roaring buzz of the summertime bugs. And me and Mary both just began to calm down and listen to what was going on. And, Mary, and Rachel began to speak to her. It was almost as if she was singing. She said, listen to what they, listen to the bugs, Mary. Listen to what they're saying. It's almost as if she was singing in her ear. She was saying, they're singing. It's okay, Mary. It's okay, Mary. It's okay. It's okay, Mary, it's okay, it's okay. And we began to calm down as we began to put our attention on something bigger than us. Man, there's gonna be a lot coming at us in the next couple of weeks. And I just wanna tell you my pastoral instinct is to come to you today and say, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. Because of the one who walked it's just as crazy a time, just as crazy a political time. He said to his friends, he said, you guys don't have to worry. And they're like, man, we're all worried. He's like, look at the birds. Look at the flowers. It sounds simple. It sounds childlike, um, but it's actually the gospel. And Jesus has a way of winning over our hearts when we take our attention off of our bodies that are going crazy. And that's why over the next few weeks, we're just gonna focus on some very simple things. And that is the way Jesus looks at things. But by asking this question, who needs Jesus? That's, that's what you need to answer. Who needs Jesus? Do you need Jesus right now? Do you need Jesus? Do you need what he's saying into your ears? I heard Jenny sing a few lines of this song that she's about to sing to us this week. And I just asked her if she would sing these words over us so that we could sit in the presence of God. These are the words of God that she's gonna be singing, the words of Jesus.
Let us pray. God, you know our worries. You know our concern. You know the things that keep us up at night. So we seek to hear faithfully these words of Jesus today. As he takes our attention uh, off of the things that we're so uh, concerned with and puts them on the things that God has created and reminds us that we are one of those. And so I just pray over each heart in here that, they, that we would know the great value that we are and that you would give us a heart that seeks after you first in all things that you would give us a reminder that we can come to Jesus over and over and over again, that we need him. As we come to communion today, that's our, uh, our way of coming to Jesus over and over again, receiving what he ultimately did on the cross through his shed blood, the forgiveness of our sins, the conquering of death, his resurrection from the grave. These things making a way for us to live. And so we say yes to Jesus today in communion and receive him. In his name we pray, amen.